Before we begin, can I take a minute to remind all of our listeners that in order to support the time spent researching, recording, editing and promoting the podcast, which as you know is free and always will be, we have set up a Patreon page. It has three levels of access ranging from just £3 a month to £12.50 a month, or your currency equivalent, and which provides a range of additional content as well as early access to the podcast. There is of course no obligation and your ability to listen to the podcast will never change. But if you feel so inclined, we'd be delighted to welcome you into the world of the Dark Money Files Supporters Club and at the upper two tiers you can come and talk to us directly once a month and you'll find us at patreon.com forward slash tdmf. Thanks and now on with the show. Hello and welcome to the ninth episode of Season 7 of The Dark Money Files in which we shine a light into a murky world. I am Ray Blake and with me is my co-host friend and business partner Graham Barrow. Hello Graham. Hello Ray. Now this one is about alternative laundries I believe Graham. An interesting title for the episode. Sounds like a pre-Britpop 90s indie band. <laughs> yes it does a bit Ray. Uh, mm. And we're not talking clothes either. No, we're not. We're talking alternative money laundering typologies, which might have been the title of that band's first album. <laughs> uh, yes. And and I think in terms of the subject matter, Ray, right, not before time. Mm. We've tended to focus on laundry through banks, partly because there has been such a stream of stories relating to huge laundromats, almost entirely focused on the money moving through traditional banking arrangements. And if you think about it, it doesn't really matter what methodology you use. At some point, you will want your hard-won, ill-gotten gains in fiat currency in order to spend it. So bank accounts are always likely to figure prominently. I think you might be making hard-won work a bit harder than it needs to with that, but I take your point, Ray. Um, <laughs> But of course, that doesn't mean other types of arrangements can't be used during the laundering process to obfuscate, obscure and muddy that process. Uh, well, I, I kind of agree, although that sentence contains significant tautology, Graham. Oh, Ray, an ology. I was taught, <laughs> I was taught ologies at school, Ray. Biology, ecology, mythology. Yeah, no, you know what I mean. Uh, tautology being the use of multiple words in the same sentence that mean the same thing, like free gift or totally complete. I do, Ray. It was just a bit of kidology on my part. Oh, very good. Uh, mm. Let's move on, shall we? There are as many ways to usurp products as there are products out there, and we can't hope to cover them all in one episode, but we can certainly look at some of the major ones and discuss laundering methods with respect to them. We could. A list, I think, that would include at a minimum what, insurance, lending, online gaming, online auctions and, and third-party reseller markets. Yeah, and maybe the black market peso exchange, Hawala, Feichian, and other non-traditional banking systems. Oh, nice. Uh, nice list, Ray. Um, I tell you what, mm. we get to include an interesting vocabulary in this podcast, don't we? You should see what we edit out. Uh, <laughs> yes, we do. And that is a lot of content. So I fancy this may well extend over two episodes. At least. And, and I think it will be worth it. Mm. So where are we going to start? We could start with a quite straightforward one, I think. Lending. OK, now, you say straightforward, but I can think of at least four ways of laundering dark money through lending vehicles. Oh, which are? Well, early repayment, overpayment, buy-to-let and guarantors. OK, well, let's uh, do what we always do then and mm -hmm. unpack each of those in a bit more detail. So do you want to start with early repayment? I do, yes. Uh, so, look, this one's quite simple, really. You obtain a loan of pretty much any description and you offer to repay it in full before the loan term is up. If the lending company don't check the provenance of the funds, both where they're coming from and how you obtained those funds in the first place, you can use your dark money to pay off the loan. 
Hmm. And the nature of credit risk is that often lenders will be delighted to be repaid early. Mm. It means they can pocket the additional interest and penalties and have the money back out earning with someone else tomorrow. Yeah, it seems like win-win. But as a lender with anti-money laundering obligations, they've got to understand the provenance of the funds coming in from you to repay their loan. Which can be tricky if you have a store of both clean and dirty money. Yes, and that's why both source of funds and source of wealth is so important. OK, now that's a quick and fairly easy way to convert big chunks of dark money into funds capable of being used in the real economy. Mm. What about if you think doing it that way might attract too much attention? Well, there are a couple of slower ways. The first is through overpayments. OK, but people are often encouraged to make overpayments to their mortgage account as it speeds up the repayment of the loan and reduces the overall interest burden. Yeah, and it may be over time, as your earnings hopefully increase, that you can add a bit extra to your monthly mortgage repayments. It's less likely that within a short space of taking out the mortgage, you start making significant overpayments on a regular basis. Because surely if you could afford higher repayments that close to outset, you would have just taken out the loan over a shorter term or taken a bigger loan in the first place. True. Mind you, it could be that you have unpredictable earnings and just now they are good, but that might not last. And that's a fair point, Graham. The lender should be prepared to do that contextual type of investigation to distinguish between something that's unusual but explainable, and something that is unusual and definitely not explainable in that kind of way. Absolutely right, Ray. And of course, that holds true for just about any money laundering typology you could think of. Exactly. Now, another way of slow laundering is through a buy-to-let scheme. OK, explain. Well, let's say you buy a property to let out to a tenant with a mixture of legitimate funds and a mortgage, perhaps. And then you decide to manage that letting yourself. You get a family member or a close associate move in who pays you rent, in inverted commas, but it's actually the proceeds of crime. Putting it through your books when you're responsible for the due diligence on the tenant makes it quite straightforward to legitimise those funds. Yeah, but you'll probably have to pay some tax on that, surely? Well, oddly, money launderers don't mind paying a bit of tax because you can't pay tax on criminal funds, obviously. So the act of paying the tax almost legitimises the underlying funds. Yeah, it's a strange thing that people who need to launder money gain, say, through tax evasion, might not mind paying a bit of tax mm. to legitimise the funds they've acquired through not paying tax in the first place. Oh, that's not an easy sentence to get out or to understand, Graham. But we, we should make the point that the tax they pay wants to be as little as possible without looking dodgy, or it would rather negate the point of the criminality in the first place. True, true. But in, in money laundering terms, a, a little bit of tax goes a long way. And if you're faced with other types of money laundering that might mean you end up with just 50 cents for each dollar or less... Well, you won't mind a 30% tax rate instead. Mm, good point. OK, let's talk finally uh, on this part about guarantors. Yes, let's. I've assumed that role a few times in, in my life on behalf of some of my children who were renting a, a property. And while it is possible to launder through that process, it's far more likely to, to happen when you're acting as a guarantor of a loan rather than a rental agreement. Yeah, shall we explain? Let's do that. OK, so let's say I have a chunk of money that I want to launder. And I've got an unblemished profile, but not much money. I go to the bank for a loan or to a building society to buy a modest property, but I don't quite satisfy their lending criteria. So you put me forward as your guarantor. That's very kind of you, Graham. That's now, no problem. A sensible lender with an excellent anti-money laundering policy will want to perform due diligence on both of us at the outset of the loan. But there are others hmm, who don't bother with doing due diligence on the guarantor unless or until they need to call in the guarantee. Which could be rather problematic. 
Yes, let's explain why that might be. Supposing you had taken out a whopping great commercial loan, let's say, I don't know, five million quid, mm. and I had guaranteed it, but without them doing any due diligence at the outset, just a bit of identification and verification on me. And presumably a credit check. Uh, yeah, I guess, yes. OK. And a few months later, I default on that five million loan. So the lender will now turn to me to repay it, because otherwise they are, frankly, five million quid out of pocket. At which point they do some proper due diligence and find out that you, the guarantor, have a bit of a dodgy past and the source of the funds is rather suspicious. Now, now I should add here that I don't have five million pounds or indeed a dodgy past or suspicious funds. It is just a story. Well, so you keep telling us, Graham. Uh, <laughs> anyway, the bank is now in a bit of a quandary. Do you reject the guarantee and lose the five million that you lent? Or do you decide that you're being overcautious with the due diligence, take the money and hope for the best? In which case, you as the launderer now get to keep five million that your associate has defaulted on and can hand to you, which mm. came from a highly reputable bank and which is now yours to keep whilst the bank has balanced its books with a credit of rather uncertain provenance. If you don't have the right approach to guarantors, it's a surprisingly easy method of laundering. Mm, and as we know, not all lenders do have the right approach to guarantors? Uh, no, Graham. Frankly, they don't. Let's move on to insurance. Yes, and to begin with, let's start with an obvious one, using dirty money to fund a regular premium investment like a whole-of-life investment bond. Exactly. If the insurance element is very low and the investment element is high and the company doesn't do its proper due diligence, you can just funnel money over time into a legitimate investment product. Lobbing in the odd lump sum addition as well, once you've established a conventional pattern of saving. Mm, but of course, sometimes the money laundering is being done as a service to others, so they won't want to wait years to get their money back. In which case, you might do a single premium bond investment and then cash it in a few months later. Because the cash in value will come as either a bank transfer or a check from a highly reputable insurance company. So it's easy to pass it off as legitimate. It is. Uh, often there are quite high early surrender charges uh, or the market may have moved against you. Uh, but for a money launderer, this is a small price to pay for legitimising their funds. Which means that investment companies of all flavours need to be exceptionally cautious around both source of funds and early surrender or encashment, especially when it triggers significant charges. Uh, which the customer doesn't seem to be bothered by, exactly. Mm. Hmm. Of course, it isn't just investment policies that are susceptible to this method, is it? Uh, High-end motor insurance, for example, where the premiums can run into thousands of pounds, mm. could also be a useful method to turn around money and make it look like you're receiving legitimate funds if you cancel the policy soon after taking it out. Uh, even more so if you cancel during the calling off period because there are no charges involved at all often. Yeah, right on, Ray. Uh, and then there are some rather more subtle ones. Now, supposing, for example, I take out an investment plan with an annual premium of, say, £5,000, but I inadvertently add an extra naught to the bank transfer and send them £50,000. They'll probably have to refund you the £45,000 overpayment, Graham. Well, that's just handy, isn't it, Ray? Especially if you just happen to close the remitting account in the meantime, so it has to be sent to another account in your name. Well, indeed. And then there's the second-hand insurance policy market, selling off endowment policies to realise their value prior to maturity. Do you know, Ray, that reminds me of an excellent plot they used in one of those police thrillers on the TV in the days when I used to watch TV. Uh, in the days when we had time. Um, well, about <laughs> about second-hand endowment policies, Graham? Well, believe it or not, yes. I think it was Tagger or, or something like that. Anyway, mm -hmm. there was a series of apparently unconnected murders which had everyone baffled until, through some weird coincidence, it transpired that two of them had a letter from the same company that bought second-hand endowments. And then, when they checked, the other victims had all sold endowment policies as well. Uh, and although this is just a wild guess, the insured value of the policy was much greater than the surrender value? 
Oh, uh, yes, it was, Ray. Uh, okay, so they were effectively buying a cheap life insurance policy and ensuring they got paid out as the new owners of said policy. Exactly, and as long as the policies weren't all issued by the same company, because I think they would have noticed, it's actually a fairly clever scam. As long as you don't mind murdering people, or as Taggart would have said, murdering people. <laughs> well, yes, and and I think we should just say... Please don't try this at home, folks. This is an explanation and not a recommendation. Well, yeah. And as a money laundering scheme, you can still use this method even if you don't go around with an axe getting early payout. <laughs> <laughs> and then you can use insurance as a secondary product in money laundering. OK, how, how, how do you mean? Well, suppose you buy an expensive car from a dodgy dealer with dirty money, possibly even cash. Uh, you insure it, fully comprehensive, and then someone steals it and you discover it burned out in some remote field. Uh, what are you going to do? I'm going to claim on my insurance, Ray. Of course you are, Graham, which arrives as a nice bank transfer or cheque from the insurance company. They're not usually interested in how you bought the car, or indeed whether it was bought for cash or from an entirely different bank account. Yeah, so you get entirely legitimate funds without having to go through the tedious process of selling the car and providing any other previous financial information that goes with it. Hmm, neat, isn't it? You know, Ray, the, the more you get into this, the more you realise that just about any financial transaction can be used to launder money. Uh, you're right, Graham. OK. Now, next time, let's enter the rather more glamorous world of casinos and gambling, auctions and fine art, some of the major non-financial routes to launder large amounts of money. Sounds like an opportunity to dress up. I'm looking forward to it. Before you go, there's just time to tell you about our forthcoming Dark Money Files live event on the 22nd of July at 12 o'clock UK time. And we'll be talking about the events in Beirut last August when a huge explosion ripped through downtown Beirut, taking hundreds of lives and causing billions of dollars worth of damage. What's not so well known is that the ammonium nitrate that exploded that day was owned by a UK shell company. And we will tell you about that and much more besides on the day. If you go to Google and search for the Dark Money Files Beirut Connection, you will find the Eventbrite page where you can book a ticket absolutely free of charge. We'll see you then.